Good afternoon. My name is Bill Taylor. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President here at the United States Institute of Peace, and I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you uh, to this building and to this event. Uh, this is going to be a great opportunity for us to go through the issues uh, that we've been looking forward to for 15 years, actually, for, to do this. So this is an opportunity for us to gather in this room with some great speakers and to listen to your comments and questions um, as well. So this will be a, participating, a participatory session here today. The Institute of Peace, um, for 30 years, has been looking for ways uh, to prevent, to mitigate, to resolve conflict around the world. And one of the ways that we've found out, we've determined, we've discovered, is something that you all know, is the importance of inclusivity. It's important that, that all people in societies are part of solutions. Um, and the Institute of Peace has been, has been in the forefront of pushing those kinds of solutions. Over the past six years, our gender efforts uh, have been led here by Kathleen Kunest, who is right down front. Uh, many of you, most of you in this room probably know her. Um, this has been uh, a, a leadership of love by uh, Kathleen, and she has done a wonderful job and has put this together with the five Nordic embassies here. I want to especially welcome and thank the five embassies for co-hosting uh, this celebration of, uh, uh, of 1325 of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. We are very grateful for their support and their help on organizing and pulling uh, this event together. Um, we have ambassadors from those, uh, from those embassies, from those countries here. Um, Ambassador of Iceland, Geir Harde, I will introduce uh, in a moment. Uh, you will hear more from him uh, very shortly. Ambassador of Finland, uh, Kirsti Kapui, who is here. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador of Denmark, Lars Gert Loza is uh, not here. Oh, He's coming at the is coming to the reception. There you are. So <laughs> we'll be here. We'll be here. Uh, Ambassador of Sweden, Bjorn Lirval, um, is also coming to the reception. <laughs> um, and the uh, short aid affairs of, uh, of Norway, um, Leila Jaklin is here. Thank you, Leila. Very good. Um, and I think in this room somewhere is the US ambassador to, former US ambassador to Denmark, um, who, uh, uh, Laurie Fulton, Ambassador Fulton, is coming. She's also coming to the reception. Is that right? <laughs> OK. Um, Earlier this year, um, the new Swedish Foreign Minister, Margot Wallström, um, uh, was here, standing right here, um, and described her explicitly feminist foreign policy. Um, we were very pleased to hear her describe to this audience and the world the kinds of things that are important um, for Sweden and indeed for the world in, in terms of uh, a, a feminist foreign policy and how that can work. Um, she talked about uh, policies that call for the equal participation of women in promoting peace and security, but also for greater efforts to protect women during and after violent conflict. Building on the work of 1325, the new, newly adopted Sustainable Development Goals declare women's equality a precondition to resolving conflict and crises around the world. Our discussion today will further examine this principle by asking what does gender have to do with global security? Over the years, the Nordic countries helping us sponsor here today, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, have institutionalized gender equality practices and policies across their countries and are now recognized as the top five ranked countries in the 2014 World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. Today, we look forward to learning more from these five small but powerful countries and explore how gender is being integrated into their own contributions to global security. Uh, we invite everyone in this room or online um, to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag 1325 at 15. So hashtag 1325 at 15. It is now my honor to introduce the Ambassador of Iceland, whom I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Ambassador Gig. Jorge is the former Prime Minister uh, of Iceland and also the former President of the Nordic Council. He will speak on behalf of all five Nordic countries and frame today's discussions. Please join me in, in welcoming the Ambassador to the stage. Ambassador Jorge.
Thank you, Ambassador Taylor, Minister Rehn, dear friends. Great to be here today. Great of my colleague from the Nordic countries to come to the reception. <laughs> You're here, Kirsty, I know that. <laughs> Let me begin by saying how, how honored I am today to, <clears throat> to be here today as we mark the 15th anniversary of UN Security Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. At this milestone, it's appropriate to look back at what has been achieved, as well as to take stock and plan our work for the future. As many of you know, the Nordic countries consistently lead gender equality ratings or rankings published by the World Economic Forum, as well as scoring high on all human rights and development indicators, like Ambassador Taylor alluded to. We therefore feel that we have something to offer through the global conversation on gender, human rights and security. Last year, the Nordic country celebrated the 40th anniversary of their formal cooperation on gender equality within the Nordic Council of Ministers. That cooperation includes sharing best practices and research aimed at advancing gender equality in the workplace and in public life. It has also been a platform for our joint struggle against gender-based violence at home and abroad, as well as prostitution and human trafficking. We have worked closely with the Baltic states following their regained independence in the 90s. We have also looked closely at how the challenges of climate change globally and particularly in the vulnerable Arctic need to be addressed with gender issues in mind. As an example, women currently account for only 15 to 20 percent of delegation leaders in UN climate negotiation, negotiations, and we should be able to do a lot better than that. This year, Denmark and Iceland celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Norway and Finland Finland have already celebrated their centennial, and Sweden will mark theirs in 2021. Now, considering that it has taken the Nordic countries decades to achieve our progress on gender equality, it's important to note that such progress is not automatically permanent, and backsliding remains possible. If we are not vigilant, that is to say, Equality between the sexes as regard the right to vote and to run for public office was, of course, one of the most important milestones in the development towards true democracy. Now, turning to the global stage, we see immense challenges in the realm of peace and security. Today, the number of refugees and internally displaced persons is higher than at any time in the UN's history. Complex internal and cross-border conflicts that are fueled by violent extremism and terrorism have made development and humanitarian work highly challenging. Women and children have been specifically targeted through campaigns of rape, abductions and outright slavery. UN Women continues to track progress towards the goal of 1325 and subsequent related resolutions. It has positively affected women's participation in politics, helping to sensitize a range of stakeholders to the benefits of women's political inclusion. This has resulted in more gender-sensitive electoral laws and more women on electoral boards and civic education teams. Despite much effort towards the ambitious goal of those resolutions, women remain largely excluded from peace processes worldwide. Women's participation in peace negotiations remains, with few exceptions, below 10% of those formally involved. Even within the UN, slow progress has been made as only 15 to 25% of UN field missions have in recent years been led by women. 
The Nordic countries have, for their part, made an effort to mainstream gender to, in their peace and security work globally. We have, for example, deployed gender advisors to serve with UN peacekeeping and NATO stabilization forces. Their role has been both internal and external. They have worked to shape the, organization, the organizations and behavior of the security forces, as well as to bring women in conflict areas into the peace process, including at the grassroots levels. While the situation is grim on many fronts, the findings of the UN Women Global Study on the implementation of Resolution 1325 also make it clear that, and I quote, women's participation and inclusion makes humanitarian assistance more effective, strengthens the, strengthens the protection efforts of peacekeepers, contributes to the conclusion and implementation of peace talks and sustainable peace, and accelerates economic recovery. End of quote. Therefore, we can say, perhaps, that the bad news is that we know we have a serious problem, but the good news is that we know what a key part of the remedy is. This anniversary of UNSC Resolution 1325 should therefore serve to rally and re-energize us in the work ambitiously started 15 years ago. We must remember that the resolution is only a tool. More effort is needed to increase the number of women and men skilled in its use to shape change developments both internationally and locally. I therefore very much, much look forward to today's important discussion and want to thank the US Institute of Peace and my Nordic colleagues for organizing today's event. I'm also very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, a wonderful lady whom I used to work with in the 90s, the distinguished Elizabeth Rehn. Minister of State Rehn is a member of the Board of Directors of the International Criminal Courts Trust Fund for Victims in The Hague and an independent expert of the High Level Advisory Group for the Global Review on United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. <coughs> a Member of Parliament for 16 years, Madame Rehn was Finland's and the world's first female Minister of Defence from 1990 to 1995. She also served as Minister of Equality Affairs from 1991 to 95. In 1995, Elizabeth Rehn was appointed UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Territory of Former Yugoslavia, a post she held for three years until 1998, when she was appointed UN Undersecretary General, Special Representative of the Secretary General in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Elizabeth Rehn co-authored Women, War, Peace with Ellen Johnson Shirley in 2002, and also was UN Rapporteur on Palestine in 2004 and the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2010. So with that, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you again for these wonderful words. I sometimes feel like being on my own funeral when I'm listening to this long list of what you have done. And that makes it always a little bit difficult to start. We have to remember that the 1325 that we very much honor today, that it is, even if it was pushed forward by the Nordic countries, and especially by uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, women organizations, it was born in Africa. It was born in Namibia, in Windhoek, uh, just before, in, I believe it was in March, I was there at a uh, workshop when the Windhoek Declaration Namibia plan of action was decided upon and then taken over to, 
to General Assembly and Security Council and became the 1325. Perhaps a little bit watered out in UN, but that things happen. But it is a good resolution. Um, it has now been debated, as we just heard, in a, at an open debate uh, just one and a half week ago in, in the UN. And um, it was a very active debate with more than 110 uh, participants uh, asking for the floor. And what was even more important that the new resolution um, that was strengthening 1325 was adopted anonymously with um, everybody putting their hand up in the Security Council. It was a little bit unsure before it uh, just the voting took place. Um, it's uh, quite true that there was the global review that was very much uh, uh, laying the ground for Secretary General's own report. I uh, had the honor to be uh, a part of the high-level advisory group who was advising and working and writing uh, with uh, Radhika Komarasvami as the uh, lead writer, author of this new uh, study. And uh, why a new study? Uh, that is quite clear that even in these 15 years from the first adoption of 1325, the situation, the conflicts have changed nature. It was when we adopted then and Security Council adopted 1325, we thought very much about Rwanda, we thought about Balkans. That was the situation then. There was already a lot of sexual violence and all of this. But now there are new elements in the empty room left by bad leadership or no leadership at all. So many of these uh, uh, Armed groups have taken their place. They have found their room, like ISIS, like Boko Haram, and all the others who are brutal, who are, so to say, changing all the, what we have thought about uh, conflicts. And um, that gives uh, also quite clear indications for the situation of, of women. Um, it's um, also important to remember something, that we talk, of course, gender is men and women. That's something we should remember. People sometimes believe that gender is women. That's not <laughs> it's the both. But um, something that we have to remember that when we talk about women and women's rights and women here and women there, women are not the same. We are not some kind of of um, cattle or something that are all the same, even if cattle is not the same. But, but though uh, we have all our own uh, expectations of life, we have very different situations in the world and uh, in the societies. And therefore, we always must remember that everybody is an individual with their own needs. Men are also not one crowd or a cattle. They are also all different. And, and uh, we have to, to really look at this. What we found out when we worked on this global, global study or global review, what you want to call it, that um, there were very big differences with uh, expectations also between South and North, that in the North, uh, it was very much of the demand of, of being uh, in, in the, uh, participating in decision making, of course sitting at the tables when uh, peace was negotiated, uh, and um, more about the equality of that kind. In the South, it was very much a question of a democracy that is coming close to your your own situation. Uh, it was a question of land ownership, of a right to own property, to economic, uh, and, and the life altogether to make it easier. But these two are not excluding each other. Of course, 
in the south, if we look at Africa, for instance, they have achieved uh, uh, equality that uh, many countries can be envying, like uh, uh, Rwanda, for instance, with more than 60% women in the parliament, elected women in the parliament, and most of the of the African states have uh, quotas and for parliament, and they are also fulfilling it. African Union has, um, uh, uh, they have as a rule that there must be in the commission of African Union as many women as men. Uh, when it was first um, adopted this rule some years ago, the, uh, the administrations uh, we're saying, oh, where are we going to find five competent women in Africa? But it was, there were no difficulties with this. A European Union could take example from this too, if we are talking about Europe, there is no rule about as many women as men. So, uh, but that is of course not all. Um, there can be differences, very much of the differences between those who are, have got the positions to be at the tables uh, and to, to be ministers, to be in the governments, and then on the grassroots level, where the, uh, the needs are really enormously big. What is also uh, something we have found out, and um, that's very close to me, as being for six years already at the International Criminal Court in The Hague in the Trust Fund for Victims that works with the, uh, with the victims of these worst crimes. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that it's not enough to put the perpetrators behind bars. Uh, it's very important to talk about transformative justice where it's not only a question of, of uh, getting the, the perpetrators to stand for what they have done, but also to look into the situation of the victims and also the societies afterwards to try to find a healing for them, because otherwise we can, cannot uh, expect any kind of, of peace to come. It's also important to remember when this is a little bit provocative, this uh, uh, what has, does gender have to do with it, with the security, that at the same time as we discussed the, uh, this global study on women, peace and security, uh, there was the discussions about, and a panel, about peace operations and about peace building. And in the panel led by uh, former President Ramos Horta, uh, it was quite clear that uh, the passages about women, peace and security were very strongly also a part of the peace operations. And then we come to the fact that it's uh, uh, the peace negotiations and creating peace. Um, it's not possible without women being a part of it. Because mostly women have to implement then afterwards what has been decided. And also it is uh, by statistics and research found that those peace um, agreements where women have been present, even if they are not at all uh, many as they should be, uh, the peace will be more long lasting because so many of the peace agreements, they, they just take some year or sometimes only a few months and then the conflict is there again. But when women are at the table, uh, things just like the justice, like the situation afterwards, uh, it's easy to decide about the hardcore, about uh, building, uh, again, reconstructing buildings, bridges, uh, these physical things. But there is so much that is psychological and important to create a new 
life after the peace agreement. Uh, I have been to so many uh, war zones, to conflicts, and I think that in all of them, the people who have gone through the conflict are suffering from some kind of war trauma. So it's very much a question of how you can heal uh, people, but also questions like social uh, health, uh, and education. Education that is so important. Uh, it's not a mantra that you have to always say. It's important to, to get especially the education for, for girls. Um, we also discussed that um, we must ask much more from United Nations um, and the leadership. Because a peace operation is not looking to any kind of, of gender issues if not the leader of the mission is uh, prepared to do something. If he is just, okay, of course, gender, what is that? It must be something that he and she, uh, more she uh, than it has been, really is devoted to. We had in our... Uh, advisory group, uh, a few men also very respected, one of them um, a general, uh, Patrick Kammert, who has worked as the force commander in, in Congo, for instance, and he especially demanded the gender training also for those who will be the highest top officials, because otherwise it will not work. Uh, one other uh, thing that we also talked about, that the reputation of UN is not very good if it continues to be, uh, be cases like Central African Republic and others, where peace, the people who are serving uh, United Nations are uh, doing crimes like, like this. And it was we proposed in our study uh, I'm quite sure it will never be made, but it's a good proposal that there should be within UN an independent tribunal to look at cases where UN personnel has been committing crimes because it's too easy to, to just get out from all of this. Um, I think that... Um, that uh, we also have found something, we Nordics together, uh, because when we cooperated a lot, because I was the only one in the advisory group from the Nordic countries, and uh, the people uh, in our ministries worked so well together, and uh, there has been then the proposal that we should institute um, uh, a Nordic Women Mediators Network with f about five from every Nordic countries. So we will tighten our uh, cooperation and look into that the Nordics really have good female mediators to be, be um, used when it's, it's uh, necessary. Now you can ask yourself at the why, I was about to say why the hell is, but that's not appropriate. But why is she, old woman still engaged with all of this. She should be absolutely now finally um, just leaving, leaving the scene for somebody else. But um, when I, with all my different tours, that was when Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and I just uh, collected material for our, uh, our uh, report, Women, War and Peace, uh, then I was in Sierra Leone. I met, it was as a matter of fact, Fatou Bensouda, uh, who took me, who now is the, the special uh, representative for, for sexual violence in war and conflict, who took me in Sierra Leone, uh, in Freetown, to a place where young girls who had been uh, just... Uh, Bushwives. They had been kidnapped as 10, 12 year old, who had come back again, but uh, nobody would 
liked to have them in their home villages. They were absolutely out from the society. So the only possibility for them was to earn their money by selling their self. And, uh, but they had uh, some kind of community, these girls, uh, 20 of them, with um, good, uh, good signs on their walls. It was a terrible place where they um, had just a bed and nothing more on some as concrete bottom. And they had like, be proud of yourself, demand condom was one of these these things. And then some others that they were some kind of union who took, uh, some of them had children, so somebody was le uh, just looking after the children. But then I asked them that, that um, what are your dreams? Because all young girls have dreams. And uh, I have a lot of uh, grandchildren many girls, uh, also great-grandchildren. And uh, I was about to, to start to cry when I listened to them. Because what they wanted of life was to, to get education, to go to school, to get a profession, a real one, not like this, selling yourself. And then perhaps to find a, and to get a good job, and find a handsome young man to marry, get a beautiful home and lovely children. And then this, but how could we dream about this? We are just doomed to, to sell ourselves for one dollar each time and die in AIDS. And then I decided that if I can do even as much, I will do that so that no Girls are without future. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kathleen Keenis, and I would like to invite our panelists uh, to the stage. And while they are joining us, I'd like to introduce you to Ambassador Don Steinberg, who has the honors this afternoon of moderating this very interesting panel. Don is president and CEO of World Learning, an international nonprofit organization that provides education exchange and development programs in more than 60 countries. You may know him as the former uh, deputy administrator at USAID and also uh, the US ambassador to Angola. And I could go on, it would take maybe part of the afternoon. <laughs> Please, I'm gonna turn it over to Don and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, it, it is a pleasure to moderate this panel with such a distinguished group. Uh, Kathleen, the one thing that she could have said in addition is my ties with this institution, which are very strong. Uh, I was a Randolph Jennings Fellow here in 2005 and had the honor of traveling around the world and living in refugee camps in Kosovo, in Colombia, in Sudan, uh, in uh, uh, Sri Lanka. And in that time, it consolidated in my mind the suffering of women in conflict situations and how we don't even address their needs in post-conflict situations. Uh, but I will say, uh, the, I think the real reason that I was invited to moderate this panel is that the PIN number on my ATM card is 1325. Uh, and it actually is. Uh, I have... I actually mentioned that on a panel that was broadcast by C-SPAN one day. And then uh, about two weeks later, I lost my ATM card. <laughs> and I'm talking with the company, and they say, does anyone know your PIN number? And I had to acknowledge that a few people who don't sleep at night uh, probably saw that panel. Uh, I've participated in a number of panels here where we've had uh, officials, and civil society leaders from developing countries and conflict situations talk about 1325. And I think that this panel is very special in that it is the view from the advocates. Uh, these are the leaders in 
pushing 1325 uh, as an uh, international agenda uh, from the north. And so I think we're going to get a unique view here of some very dedicated people. We've got the subject of uh, global security. What does gender have to do with it? And I think we all know the countries around the world that are peaceful and prosperous and involve women uh, in the leadership of their country and in peace processes do not tend to traffic in drugs or people or weapons. They don't send off large numbers of refugees across borders or oceans. Uh, they don't tend to harbor pirates or terrorists. They don't transmit pandemic diseases, and they don't require international boots on the ground. And so as we think about this issue, let's keep that in the back of our mind, that women have everything to do with global security. I wanted to begin, uh, we're going to do this in alphabetical order, uh, and uh, we're going to begin with uh, Brigadier Agrasov. Uh, and he has already authorized me to butcher the pronunciation of his name, uh, which I have just done. Thank you. Uh, the Brigadier is the chief at the Regional Command South in Denmark, where he oversees the strategic and operational planning of the Danish defense. He has also had the opportunity to serve in leadership positions in Afghanistan and Bosnia, Kosovo, Pakistan, India, and one would wonder who he upset at the ministry to have him assigned to all of those conflict situations. All of them. All of them. And so, uh, can you talk about when you first thought of this as a key issue in the implementation of peace processes, Absolutely. and perhaps in particular in Afghanistan? Sure. Can I stand up? It works Please. better for me being a military man. And I can easily see people in their eyes and see that all the girls are having their cell phones, doing a lot of things they shouldn't be doing, or we're talking up here. Anyway, that coming from an old man. Um, I worked in Afghanistan as uh, the first time where I actually started focusing on using women to counter what I was there to counter. So I was enough to um, counter corruption in the world's most corrupt country. I was also combating uh, drugs, that part of the drug production that actually funded the uh, insurgency groups. And as if that wasn't enough, I actually took on working the gender issue in that context because that was also a big issue in a country that really suppresses women. What does gender have to do with all that? About 50% plus, and if you add up the synergies, 80 to 85%. As the ambassador said, women, they don't like to see their sons and daughters to be killed in a conflict. They don't want to see their husbands or their kids become drug addicts, and they don't instigate violence usually. So that is a good point of working out from. And that's why slowly I started to figure it out in Afghanistan. We weren't actually getting any progress counting corruption. Karzai and his government, they didn't care. As long as we paid, they were happy. They took the money and did what they did. Then somebody came to me. I had a small team of civil society outreach. And one of these very uh, efficient girls came to me and said, why don't we reach out to uh, women? Why don't we try to integrate women in what we do? Sir, you can travel all over Afghanistan. You got all the assets you need. All you have to ask is to get one or two women on board every flight we go, and we'll start spreading out the good word. Let's get these civil society women together and spread out the good story that women can actually make a difference. So I started doing this and did it for almost a year. And uh, when I had to uh, hand over to my successor, I said, this is very important for you. Drugs is one thing, corruption another thing. But if you do not handle these women and make sure they're safe and they can do what we started out for them to do, they will die. Unfortunately, he didn't have the same feeling about women as I did, so it all collapsed. And a lot of these women that I work with either fled, got killed, 
and uh, lost quite a bit of their nerve. But some of them are still out there fighting because gender has got everything to do with stabilizing even a case study as bad as Afghanistan. Everything is bad, you'll find it in Afghanistan. Child abuse, women abuse, corruption, drug production, and it's a disease that has to be stopped. And the only way I can think of, after been working it for 15 months, is using women to make a difference. It's not because I've studied 30 and 25 before I went to Afghanistan, because it was an idea that was sewn into my head, and it grew, and it still grows, and I think it's the only way we can do something for change. I can work with the dinosaurs, that is the uh, administration in Afghanistan, but I like little mammals to grow up and take over, and there the women come in to make a big difference. They understand what I'm talking about. They understand the, the concept of peace because they're the ones being abused every day. They're the ones who have their money stolen because their husband is a drug addict or because the Taliban and other insurgent groups come in and rape them or because their husband has been dealing with the wrong guys and they have to pay the debts using their kids or their wife. So they understand the situation and they understand there is a way out of it. I truly love to hear what you said. You pinpointed most of my uh, experiences from Bosnia, Russia, India, Pakistan. Women are always at the abusive end. They've been abused by almost everybody. And they're the weak, so we say, but they are so strong that they stood up against these Taliban. They stood up against the administration of Karzai and they started fighting. And a lot of them died in doing so. But they still keep on fighting because they understand it's a way forward. If they want a better society, education, they have to stand up, just like I do for you. I travel a lot, and wherever I went, I saw women, young women, older women, wanting to do something to get an education. Even though they were sitting in a shabby room with old books, they were trying to get an education, trying to learn English, to understand the, lo the law and how society works. Get women to work with their media. Get women to work with the rule of law. Make them sit in during the sessions when there's a court of law set and make sure that they actually follow the protocol. It's a difficult thing in, in Afghanistan, where most of the judges, they can't read. They never read the law, but still they're the judges. They need somebody to pressure them, to monitor them, and make sure it actually follows the rule of law as it is laid out in Afghanistan. Now, I travel a lot, uh, meeting a lot of commanders in the field, and I especially want to quote one of them. And I said, during a meeting, sir, I know you're fighting a battle, but if you want to win this war, and you really want to win the battle, you have to encounter counter-corruption, counter-drug that finances the insurgency, and you have to work with the women. And you know what he said to me? I don't have time for this shit. I got a war to fight. Get out. So these are my colleagues. So we have to go to the top. A fish rots from the head, so the Chinese say. But if you do not get the head to stop rotting and start working with us and understand this important issue, we're not going to move forward. That's why 1325 is so important. Thank you. So, Brigadier, I want to give you a heads up on the question that's going to come after this panel, which is how do you, in that process, ensure that the voices of the women themselves are reflected in the policies you adopt? And how do you ensure that they have safety and security as they put forward their views? So if you could cogitate on that for a moment. Uh, I also wanted to do, introduce Captain Bjorsen. Uh, she is an army officer working in the Swedish Armed Forces Headquarters. She's now the gender advisor to the Chief of Operations at uh, the Joint Forces Command. Uh, and the question that I'd like you to address is how do you, at the operational level, within a ministry that may not really take this all that seriously because they do have wars to fight, how do you actually operationalize this? Um, 
I would like to start with uh, this uh, question. What does gender have to do with it? And the latest resolutions uh, and the recommendation of the global study now gives, us, gives me tools to, to re-energize the, the women, peace and security agenda and take even more steps to move from, the, from words to action. And I think that the message of the global study was very clear. Uh, women's leadership and participation contribute to the conclusion of uh, peace talks. It leads to more sustainable peace agreements. It strengthens the military mandate and improves the peace operations possibilities to deliver security to both men and women on an equal basis. And it helps counter violent, violent extremism. So, basically no further agree, uh, arguments are needed, but one of the most underutilized tools that we have for successfully building peace is the meaningful inclusion of women. And uh, since it has been mentioned, uh, Sweden has a feminist government and it has declared that gender equality is one of their top priorities. And uh, the Swedish government has made a clear commitment to promoting gender equality in uh, all policy making. A feminist government works to combat inhibitive gender roles and structures and to let gender equality have a formative impact on policy choices and priorities and in the allocation of resources. And the overarching objectives uh, of Sweden's gender equality policy is that women and men are to have the same power uh, to shape society and their own lives. However, coming from a military organization, I would like to highlight a few things uh, when it comes to why gender equality is important for the Swedish armed forces. And, uh, to start with, I would say that the legitimacy of the armed forces is partly based on how well we as an organization represent uh, society and since gender equality and women's participation and equal rights uh, to shape society and their own lives uh, is an important question for most Swedes. Uh, it is essential that we, the armed forces, reflect these uh, uh, values in, the, in our forces. And since we need a, a wide spectrum of capacities, uh, we, we need to view the whole population as a basis for recruitment. We need both men and women. And lastly, our capability to understand and assess the different security needs and concerns of different groups will increase our operational effectiveness in, our, uh, in other words, our ability to, to deliver security based on the different needs of women, men, boys and girls. Should I go into detail Please. on your question? Yeah. Uh, my task uh, at the headquarters uh, is to support the commander, uh, chief of operations, in uh, an analyzing uh, when we are planning uh, operations what uh, different impacts, needs, uh, concerns women, men, boys and girls have and uh, what, is, what is important to know here is that I am only supporting him in this. He is responsible and then he also leads and evalu evaluates all operations, national and international. And in this, we need to, to uh, implement and also follow up so we can improve. Yeah. Fantastic. So the question that I'm going to pose for you mm -hmm. is, I assume you too have dinosaurs in the ministry. And how do you <laughs> persuade them short of yes. ordering them to take action, <clears throat> which may or may not work, how do you persuade them that this is part of their mission yes. and part of achieving their goal? Hmm? So I'm pleased to now introduce uh, Carla Coppell, who was the uh, first senior coordinator for 
women's empowerment and gender equality at USAID and a long history of engagement in this issue previous to that. She is now the chief strategy officer at AID and I think the success of incorporating gender into what has happened at that agency is the reason that she is now an honorary member of the Nordic community uh, <laughs> participating in this panel. Uh, Carla, in terms of uh, addressing this challenge at USAID and with larger within the US government, uh, the United States only signed on to 1325 and the commitment to do a national action plan 10 years after it started. Uh, what have been the successes you've seen uh, since you arrived at USAID and even before that? And what are the unfulfilled uh, requirements moving ahead? Thanks. I, first of all, my favorite honorary designation is as an honorary Nordic. And, uh, and I would be remiss um, if I didn't say that uh, you, sir, were my partner in driving this forward in sure. USAID. Whatever progress we've made uh, was born of your leadership. Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's actually a perfect moment for us to reflect a bit because, um, as Ambassador Steinberg said, uh, five years ago is when uh, Secretary, then Secretary Clinton committed to making a national action plan and I was lucky enough to have been brought into the administration to actually um, create that plan in, in partnership with others, uh, including Don. And, and um, it's rare that you're advocating for something outside of government and then you're brought in to be able to make it a reality. Uh, and that was a, a great honor uh, that was bestowed on me. And now, three years after the actual creation of our plan, we are doing our first stock taking exercise. Um, and looking at three years of the plan on the 15th anniversary to say, where do we go from here? And I think that what we've found is, first of all, that there was in some ways pent up desire for us, to, us the US government, to take more action around women, peace, and security. Uh, when we started on this road, there was very little in the way of investment uh, around the agenda within USAID. Um, and dare say across the government and when we have complete we're just completing our three-year assessment we see now that there's over 350 million dollars uh, being dedicated to the agenda within within AID um, much of that uh, new investments spurred by small seed money but really by people who were committed and believed that this agenda was important um, when we look at what that money is translated to, uh, we know that tens of thousands of women are now engaged in peace processes around the world. Many of those are not the visible headline peace processes uh, that you see uh, in the news every day, um, but they're local level conflicts where women are playing an absolutely fundamental role uh, in preventing the outbreak of violence, in mediating among uh, different parties, in uh, ensuring that we prevent the outbreak of that violence and that we are treating those who are injured. We know that in addition to those over 50,000 women around the world that um, we're doing work in over 40 countries around this agenda um, and we know that we're treating millions of survivors of gender-based violence. Um, that however paints a very rosy picture and it's a if you're looking in relative terms from where we were three years ago to today we've made a lot of progress and I would um, and I when I go out to visit um, colleagues in the field uh, for example I was recently in Kenya and spoke to a gentleman who was working on the third generation of a peace building program that he's been involved with through those three generations. He said, you know, each iteration of this project, we've done more to engage uh, women and to address women's needs. And I said, well, why, why do you do that? And he said, well, the project works better. <laughs> um, and, and it's that kind of realization that we want to cultivate and we want to raise awareness of. Um, that said, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say that there also are really, really important gaps and things that we know we need to strive to do better around um, going forward. Uh, so we, 
We know, for example, that when you look at the numbers of mediators that are women, we're falling behind. And when you look at mediators at, a glo at the big global conflicts that you hear about, we're even further behind. Um, we know that certain issues in our national action plan, we didn't really confront um, issues. We, we didn't deal with non-state actors to the extent that those non-state actors now loom incredibly large within the international community. Um, we know that certain threats, uh, like the threat of climate change and how that interacts with um, issues related to the women, peace, and security agenda are places we have gaps in our national action plan, and therefore we have gaps uh, in the work that we're doing. We know that while we've done enormous work around uh, both trying to prevent and treat gender-based violence, um, that new threats are emerging, that actually gender-based violence has become, I think, more prevalent, not just more reported, but more prevalent in certain circumstances. And we have a lot of work to do to, um, to meet that need. And even in terms of the implementation of our work, where we're trying to work with women uh, across countries, and particularly countries where there's a lot of violence, it's very difficult for us to reach them, to help empower them, to work with them and build their capacity. So um, I would say we've made a lot of progress. Uh, and part of that progress is knowing what we didn't know and where there are gaps we need to fill. Um, and we have a lot to learn from the countries represented on the stage because a lot of them have been engaged in work around this agenda for much longer than we have. And so I really look forward to the broader conversation of where we go from here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you to address the, the challenges of institutionalizing this because we've seen some real progress. Uh, we saw we had a Secretary of State who woke up in the morning every morning and said, what can I do for women's empowerment around the world? Fourteen months from now, we may not. And how can we ensure that this agenda stays firm, that we don't lose the progress we've made, for example, in Afghanistan or other places on the women's agenda? Uh, nice, easy question. Uh, Ambassador Nylander is the Norwegian Special Envoy to Colombia. Uh, he has a remarkable background in terms of serving as a, uh, a judge in the district court you know, of Norway, a lawyer in the private sector. He's a real estate and communications technology expert. What haven't you done in your life? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, and he is now overseeing on behalf of, of Norway what promises to be one of the singular achievements in peacemaking in our time, ending a civil war that has lasted literally a half a century. Uh, and if you read the newspapers, there is success every single day in this agenda. And so what I'd like you to reflect on is how did gender enter into the process? What special considerations do you have to incorporate women? And how to make sure that they are still involved as we move to the implementation process of any peace agreement you reach? Again, a very easy question. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, that's a very kind reading of the Colombian peace process. <laughs> we don't have successes every day or every week or every month, but it's true that it is advancing positively and it's moving in the right direction. Um, Norway has been a uh, facilitator in the Colombian peace process since its start in uh, 2012. So this is a peace process which is going on between the Colombian government and uh, the left-wing guerrilla uh, the FARC EP. And the armed conflict in Colombia, of course, has lasted for more than uh, five uh, decades. It has had serious humanitarian consequences with terrible uh, suffering for the uh, local uh, population. And these Peace talks, these are not the first peace talks in Colombia between the government and the FARC, but they really pr provide uh, the best opportunity to uh, reunite a society torn apart by uh, conflict. 
the peace process is now in its uh, final stage. Um, both parties have said that they want to reach a uh, final peace agreement before the 23rd of March 2016. Um, we are taking them on their words. They are motivated. They have said this publicly. So this is a peace process which is really entering its uh, final stage. As we've heard uh, previously today, um, 15 years after the adoption of Security Council Resolution uh, 1325, women are still uh, severely underrepresented in official uh, peace processes. Um, inclusion of women in peace processes is, of course, not only the right thing to do from a, a, an equality perspective, it's also the intelligent thing to do. Um, when you include women, you have better uh, peace accords, you increase the possibilities of reaching a uh, negotiated solution. You have, as we've heard, a better chance of having that peace agreement being implemented. And as we all also have heard earlier today, uh, you increase the chances of having a uh, peace agree agreement that will uh, that will be implemented and respected over uh, time. Um, at the very start of the confidential uh, peace talks in Colombia, um, there were women present in each of the two uh, delegations. These were secret peace talks that was going on in Havana in the first part of 2012, there were women in, in both delegations. Very positive. The framework agreement that the two parties managed to hammer out, took them about six months, does not have any reference to the gender issue or 1325. And during the peace process, we have seen clearly that both parties have showed an increasing awareness of the gender perspective and a grow growing uh, realization of the importance that it has for the legitimacy of the peace process. When we speak to, um, what should I say, reluctant parties in peace processes, not necessarily the Colombian, uh, the first reaction you sometimes get is denial. One, why is this important? And then they might get to the understanding that this is important because other people think it, it is important. Women's group thinks it, it is important. The international community thinks this is important. So we need to put some effort into this issue. That's positive in itself. And then the last stage, I would say, is when the parties understand that this is important, not only because it's right, but because it works. It really works and it produces a better end result. So one reason for the, um, for the uh, growing um, understanding of the two parties in the Colombian peace process of the importance of gender issues uh, is the mobilization uh, of women in Colombia. And um, the big majority of uh, civil society organizations in Colombia are led by women. Um, so this was an important uh, uh, factor. Um, in 2013, a summit was organized on the initiative of these women's groups. Um, uh, and 500 women from all over Colombia took part and they did this to promote the participation of women in peace building and importantly to provide inputs to the peace process that was going on uh, in 
Havana, Cuba at that uh, time. So pressure from civil society has been very important. Um, but the parties have also themselves recognized that uh, inclusion of women is important for the legitimacy of the process, uh, both within Colombia and internationally. And increasing, increasingly, they have understood that uh, inclusion and putting the gender issue on the table is important for the end result. Um, in mid, mid last year, uh, the parties established a gender commission, um, which is working alongside with the peace table in Colombia, um, basically to make sure that the peace accords includes the voices of women and to review the previously negotiated uh, texts and to uh, make sure that the gender perspective was taken into, into consideration. And that this is really historic. This is the first time in any peace process where such a gender commission has been created and where uh, both parties are represented in the, in the commission. So this is uh, historic, it's exceptional, it's the first uh, time. And this gender commission uh, did invite several de delegations of Colombian women to Colombia, um, to Havana. And uh, this direct participation of victims and women, women not only as victims, but women as victims, but also as uh, peace builders. It has had a very important impact on the table where the women have shared their experience of how the armed conflict has affected them and where they have also uh, brought concrete proposals to uh, the peace table. And these women, these uh, delegations that were traveling from Colombia to Havana, Cuba to meet with the delegations, did not only meet with the uh, gender commission, uh, they met with the heads of delegations. And this is important that the heads of delegations, the leaders of the two sides, uh, show their commitment to uh, uh, this uh, issue. And it really showed that the heads of delegations take this issue uh, seriously. The mandate for a truth commission, which was agreed in June of last year, is one concrete result of uh, the gender commission and the focus on gender issues. And the mandate of that truth commission states that a gender perspective should be fully integrated into the work of the commission. And there will be, I think this is, this is also a first time, uh, uh, established a special working group within the Truth Commission that will make sure that uh, the gender issue is taken care of, of throughout the work of the Truth Commission, which will pro probably last for between three and five um, years. With the um, agreement on the establishment of a special jurisdiction for peace um, just a couple of weeks back, um, it was made clear by both parties that there would be no amnesties for, and, no, and no impunities, no amnesties and no impunities for sexual uh, violence. Um, the Colombians with this uh, special jurisdictions are on their way to establishing their own mechanism for transitional justice. Um, it will be a transformative mechanism, um, transformative justice, as Elizabeth was mentioning in her intervention. 
um, it will not only deal with the past, but it will also focus on the future, transforming uh, the Colombian society for the future. And in this way, they are seeking uh, not they are seeking to prevent history from repeating itself and to put an end to mass violations of human rights, including uh, sexual crimes. So this is a huge uh, uh, step uh, forward for Colombia and I think for uh, the Colombian peace process and for uh, international uh, human rights and international criminal. Thank you, that, that's excellent summary. I, I did want to ask, uh, I recently wrote an article proposing that the international community refuse to support any peace process that doesn't have 30% women's participation. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we don't want to waste our resources supporting a peace process that will not succeed, almost by definition. It sounds like you have moved beyond just participation to effective participation because quotas, we all know, are not enough. You can have people in the room, but unless they're empowered. So I'd like to, in the second round, you to address how did you or the Colombians or anybody empower these women to play the role that you're indicating they are? Now I'd like to ask Elizabeth to, to comment on anything she's just heard. I have tremendous respect for, for Elizabeth. Uh, we were serving on the civil society advisory group to Ban Ki-moon together, and she was the voice of reason, uh, the voice of, of practicality on the ground. And yes, she was grandmotherly towards the rest of us. Uh, but in addition, if you have not read Women, War, and Peace from 2002, please do. It is fresh. I read it uh, over the last week in preparation for this panel again. It not only focuses on the big issues, but it presents case studies of how War can affect health issues, education issues, housing, displacement. It is a living, breathing document, and you deserve great credit for that. Thank you, Donald. It's, uh, it has always been good to work with you, and you are kind and nice. That's not <laughs> everybody <laughs> in the world <laughs> that you can say that about. Just a few comments. Uh, excellent presentation, so interesting. Uh, I, when I listened to, to, to uh, Fleming and, and to Anna, I thought of this, that it's uh, very important to point out to that we must uh, make sure that we have much more uh, women as officers in the peacekeeping forces and uh, also in the police, civilian police serving outside because women have though other possibilities to meet with women in many of, of the conflict areas where it's not easy for men to, to just reach them. And um, Anna, you said about this new study, global study, and I'm very pleased that I had a little finger with that too. Because even if it's uh, not uh, as handy as Ellen's and my was, but uh, these almost 400 pages, 400, I really recommend that you have it as some kind of information because it's really a good, it's a good study and um, thank you for also admitting it. Carla, I'm so pleased to welcome you in this Nordic family. Uh, uh, you were there in the Nordic family already when they had the preparations and we should have a video conference together but something with the techniques were broken so we didn't get the touch with, with your side of this. But you said something very important, you said many important things but this uh, with the work continuing where it's not the flashing news that you are just on the front page, that we have to... I'm quite disturbed by the fact um, I was yesterday talking at the panel about the Dayton Peace Accords 20 years ago soon, 
and um, when uh, when there are new we, we have Rwanda we had Bosnia where as the flashing new news uh, then it was Afghanistan and Iraq and and uh, Arab Spring and now Syria and then we forget and we leave those they are not in our attention anymore the others who absolutely need to be also looked at and like with um, the Dayton I am sometimes thinking that if 1325 would have existed then uh, it could have perhaps been helpful for the women of Srebrenica. And then uh, my congratulations to my Nordic brother, to Norway, for this Colombia uh, peace, peace negotiations and your efforts in that, because you know that in the global study we have pages about this, because that is really showing that women are needed in the peace negotiations and they can make a difference. So it's really fine. That's Let excellent. the floor to others. Thank you. So if we could just take a couple of minutes and address the issue that I raised, or if you don't want to address that issue, anything else that you want to comment on? Sure. Um, the Trigger first there. thing you asked for was, um, how do you ensure the security of these people? It's easy when you're there. When you're on the ground, when you've got troops in the area, it's easy. But as long as you move away from the area, these people get attacked not by Taliban or Haqqani or any others. They get attacked by their families. So really, there is no way you can actually assure their 100% security. So all you can do is hope for the best. And when you're there, Apply a little bit of conditionality. When these people stay alive, we will continue to fund you. And surprisingly, they stay alive. I know it's not very nice to say it this way, but uh, there's a saying, I think it's an American word, money talks and BS walks. And, and that's the only language I've learned that people in Russia, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan understand. Conditionality. If you apply conditionality, it works. We had a big issue with the uh, female officers being integrated in the Afghan army and the police. They were being sexually abused, they were being harassed, they were giving shitty food and shitty quarters. And uh, my dear colleagues from Norway were actually funding a great part of that program. So, as for the first time, conditionality was applied to the Afghans. You will not get these $50 million unless these conditions are improved. And you know what? It worked. But when we tried to do that with other governments and other programs, it never really succeeded, never took off the ground. But conditionality is one way to assure that things actually do take place and happen. Thank you. But it's always a pleasure to work with females because they're so dedicated and they really want to do and make a difference. And they do. I don't know what drives them, but it's not money, because I did never bring any money around to anything. I only brought sweet talk, motivating, and they ate it all. And they actually went out there and did the job. I'm sorry to say, many of the ones I work with are dead. Elizabeth said, we need more female officers in the police and the army. It's true, but it cannot save them all. We had female police officers, we had female officers on the ground in Helmand, training police and military. And even when I was there, they got killed. Not by Taliban, not by local thugs, but by their cousins and brothers, because they didn't want them to be a part of a working society. They should be back in their houses, tending the kids and locked up. So, there's no way you can guarantee it, but we try our best, and even though we train these excellent females, excellent police officers, they're really good at their job, but it's so much against the culture, the religious belief in Helmand, that the families will not allow them to do a good, honest job. But still, they keep on coming, and we do whatever we can to protect them. But if I'm not there with my gun all the time, I can't do that. 
Captain, uh, there's a new Disney movie that's about to come out about what would have happened if the meteor that hit the United States, uh, that hit the world and killed all the dinosaurs had <laughs> missed. I sometimes think that it missed a number of the ministries of defense around the world. Uh, how do you deal with that challenge of people who just don't get it? Yeah. How do you combat dinosaurs? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to, to uh, go back to maybe 10, 11 years ago. There were some very clever people uh, at the headquarters and um, because we had uh, by then, we were working with gender equality within the HR and the personnel staff. But then they realized, okay, in order to, to really make this work, to, 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 to integrate and to have any success, basically, we need to get into the core business of the armed forces, which is operations. And uh, thanks to some strong individuals and leadership, because leadership is a crucial. Um, they managed to get a uh, gender advisor into the chief of operations uh, staff. So I would say uh, you need leadership. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the one thing, because you can be the best gender advisor in the world, but if, if your commander does not allow you to work, it doesn't matter. You have no results. So uh, there were some, some strong leaders and strong individuals, and uh, that's where it all started. And um, with, with strong leaders, you, you can also make uh, gender mainstreaming work. Uh, basically, each individual has to do uh, gender in his or her daily work. <coughs> because uh, we have one gender advisor, we have uh, appointed gender focal points and so on. But in order to really get things done, everybody needs to, to work with this and uh, do what they can in their, in their positions, so to say. And for that to, to really succeed, uh, we need the commander to, to put this as a priority. He needs to say, this is important, uh, I prioritize this, and we will work with this. And then Excellent. this is how we <coughs> go about. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Carla, it's not as fun to institutionalize something as to invent it, but it's equally important. Yeah, I think um, in some ways it's more important, but uh, the, it can be fun because when you hear about people from around a big global <laughs> organization coming back and saying how they're doing things differently or how they have greater receptivity, you feel a real sense of reward. I think that there are two key components that will, we hope, make this stick. One is the institutional frame. We were fortunate in putting forward a national action plan in conjunction with a new gender policy, a new counter-trafficking in persons policy, uh, a new program for children in adversity, a new gender-based violence national strategy. Those building blocks, because they were complementary and synergistic, are self-reinforcing. What we've done subsequently to that, to creating that frame, is put money behind it, create operational and talent-related incentives, put it in performance evaluations for the folks who are working around the world, um, embedded it in our regulations for operations, um, embedded it in contracts that extend out for five, seven years into the future, um, and we're trying to build the skills and train our workforce so that they know how to move the agenda forward while we create a learning environment that says, this made a difference in, in place X, and now we're going to refine the approach uh, and use it in this other location uh, so that we get better and better at doing this and so that the results from those investments are evident uh, and quantifiable and demonstrate that the commitment to this agenda is creating a virtuous cycle. So that's one key set of components that I think helps make it stick. On the other side, and, and perhaps uh, as important or, or more important, and I think 
um, as evidenced by the discussions around the Colombian peace process, is that we really need to elevate the voices of women on the ground as an intimate part of the conversations and the work that we do around this, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to help hold us all accountable uh, and sustain the commitment to this agenda, uh, whether it's for women's voices and peace processes or whether it's for dealing with women's priorities and needs um, before, during, and after those processes. And that's about um, honing their advocacy capacity, uh, but more importantly than honing anything they do, because they're already doing tremendous work uh, in every conflict environment you can imagine around the world, it's about helping increase their visibility, it's about elevating their networks, it's about linking them to those in positions of authority and helping them get into positions of authority, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to make change that sticks, and our job is to facilitate that process. One of the uh, quotes that I've heard quite frequently at AID is nothing about them without them. And that, I think that typifies what you're saying. Ambassador, uh, how do you make sure women are actually effective in peace negotiations, post-conflict reconstruction? <clears throat> well, I, I think it wasn't really an, a question of empowering in this particular case, empowering the women mm -hmm. in the two peace delegations in Havana. They were uh, pretty powerful at the outset. Yeah. Um, and they were supported by uh, the focus from Colombian women's organizations, uh, the voices on the ground. And we, along with the rest of you, have of course supported uh, uh, women's organizations, civil society in Colombia and other conflict countries over years. So that's one very important uh, aspect. The other thing we did to raise awareness was to help bring in experts on these issues to Havana, to the parties, both to the FARC and to the government and to the table itself. That helped raise the awareness. Um, representatives of the, uh, of the United Nations, SRSG on violence and sexual conflict, for example, traveled to, um, to Havana and spoke to the parties. That helped mm -hmm. raise awareness. Um, we have a special focus on this issue in Oslo, in our Columbia team. Hilde Salvesen, who is present here today, is focusing particularly on this issue, travels to Havana each round, talks to the parties, helps to maintain, helps to secure to maintain this, this issue on the, on the agenda. Um, so I think those are the mm -hmm. couple of examples of how we have worked to, 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 to not to empower the women at the table, but to help uh, put, right. put this agenda on the table and raise awareness on this issue also among the other, uh, other uh, delegates uh, for the two delegations. Well, thank you, and thank you for the reminder that use even of the word empowerment is really paternalistic, and so thanks for catching me on that one. Uh, we've got about 25 minutes uh, for some questions, uh, and we're going to take them in groups of three, and if we don't have people coming to the mics, I'm going to pick out people to <laughs> speak, so uh, please make your way. Please just raise your hand. Uh, okay, we've got Vivian down here. One of the great advocates for this agenda in the world. Thank you. Please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Vivian Lowry Derrick, and I have this little NGO, the Bridges Institute, but I'm absolutely committed to 1325 and women's equality. And I want to thank you each and every one for these extraordinary presentations. Um, my question is um, about women in the military. You've talked about the importance of 
uh, the support of senior leadership. My question goes to the rank and file soldiers. I'm wondering, is it important that um, they believe in the integration of women, that it's important for them and it's in their best interest, in their self-interest, to see a military that is um, more competent and that, 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 ha that includes absolutely everyone? And if this is the case, then are there any special strategies that you have used um, are there incentives that you can give to um, rank and file so that they see the importance ultimately of gender integration? Thank you. Great question. Uh, please. Thank you. My name is Eva Kolodner. I work with Global Fund for Women. We, for the last 30 years, have funded grassroots women-led organizations on the ground around the world. And we work to advocate and raise the voices of women activists and women's movements around the world. So. Thank you, Carla, particularly for raising the issue of involving women in civil society in peace processes. But I wonder if each of you could speak a little bit further about how you involve women's rights activists on the ground. In every country you've mentioned, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Colombia, there are incredible activists in the women's rights um, communities and women's human rights defenders um, who should be at all of these tables. And I'd love to hear just a little bit more in depth about how you actively bring those extremely strong, as you just said, um, already empowered women, but into those uh, places where they can participate more actively in driving peace processes. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Uh, up there, and then... You'll be part of the second round. Oh. My name is Faith Bradley. I study public policy, have a PhD in public policy, but I'm curious to know why uh, having an officer in some region can be cause of their death, like in Afghanistan, but similar country that is close to it, like um, Pakistan or maybe UAE or Jordan, they were able to implement it. So my question is, were, is there is a way to kind of like implement similar uh, model of these country into country that resists women uh, working in these fields? So we have questions about integration of uh, women into the armed forces, uh, whether there are good models out there to do that, how do you persuade the grunts that it's important, and then on the flip side, how do you involve women activists in their own countries and ensure that their voices are heard. So, who would like to, please. According to the um, Danish National Action Plan relating to 1325, it is said specifically that the police and the military should integrate a lot more people of the opposite gender than mine into the armed forces and the police forces. It is a strict goal. Um, the army has for a long time had a, a goal to increase. It's a little bit difficult in the army. I don't know why, maybe because it's a harsh work. You break your nails and stuff like that. It, it, it initially starts out well. We get recruiting a lot of young women. I, I mean, really a lot. But after these initial three to six months, they tend to disappear. It's a little bit easier in the Air Force and in the Navy. Maybe because of the nature of the work. I don't know. But that's the way it's been like. We've been having women in my army since 1972. But we never really got above the 7% in the army. But when we deploy, we use females in our combat troops. There, there are no limitations to what they can do. And let me tell you a good, a good story. Um, we have what we call the lifeguard. These are tall men, taller than me usually. They were deployed to Afghanistan. But one of their NCOs, the sergeant, was about 156 centimeters high. And she was the leader of these tall men. And the, the reason why I remember it, because they, they forgot to order a, a frag glass for her, so I had to make a special order for that. But this little girl was actually fighting in the, in, in the helmet in the green zone with these big guys. And she was doing a tremendous job. So they can do it. And has been proven over and over again that can do it. But I still don't get it. It's very difficult to get female to stay in the army. 
and, and specifically to become officers. When they do, we make very good use of them. I mean, they have been driving our PRTs, our female projects in CIMIC, all over Afghanistan. The same with the police. But the number of females is still too low to actually move all over the place. And if I take this, uh, I like to use the, the paintbrush. If I take a paintbrush and take out the world map and take it from Nigeria across northern Africa, across, across Middle East, and way into Asia, there you'll find issues where we need women to get in contact with other women. And if we do not have the women, we will not have the same dialogue, we will not get off the ground. Once we're off the ground, we can start working and talking to the females, no problems, as long as you don't get too close. So we definitely need to get off the ground and get more females so we can deploy them into our missions. And we've been working this problem, this task, for many, many years. And we're still working it, and we are being pushed and whipped all the time. But you can bring a horse to the throw, but you cannot force it to drink. Maybe our incentives are not good enough, I don't know, but the nature of the work is maybe in the Army what keeps a lot of uh, young women away. I don't know. We try in a way, and uh, when we succeed, we have very good results. And what was the other question? Um, that's, that's fine. Okay. We, we can have other people address. Uh, by the way, for Americans, 156 centimeters is 5 foot 1. Uh, I just, just did the math, so, uh, Elizabeth? Just a few words about the national action plans. That is a way to really find a way for, for those women groups, and if it's working well, and there, of course, you have to press your, your governments that they should create this, because when they are ideal, they are a creation, but a cooperation with the, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, different groups and different ministries, uh, administration, and sitting together looking at what should really be the outcome of a national action plan. Uh, I know that you have done in um, United States when we have talked about that. Uh, others are already in their third version updating so that they they are fulfilling the new demands. But when it's ideal, then it should also be looked into that are the different ministries fulfilling their obligations. Is this working? But that's something you can start with to, to mm -hmm. be in the club, so to say. Anna, or Captain? Yes, uh, I would like to address the first uh, question. And uh, for, for the Swedish Armed Forces, it is important that all, throughout all ranks, uh, that they have understanding and that they uh, comply with this. It's, it's based on our legislation. You're not to discriminate anybody on their gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, and so on. And those values are reflected uh, within the armed forces and it's also strengthened in our code of conduct. So it's absolutely very important uh, because if you don't uh, adhere to that, you, you're not welcome in the armed forces, basically. And I would also like to address what the brigadier said. <laughs> I do not agree that uh, broken nails would be the reason for women not to stay. I would say that there are um, structures, um, norms, um, I don't know, I identities, it's, it's uh, things that we are working on this very hard. Uh, I mean, it's, we still have challenges with just basic things like material, personal equipment and so on, but I don't believe this is the uh, biggest uh, obstacle. It's, it's something with, that you can't see, basically. We, we, are, we are struggling with these patriarchal norms, if you say. And, um, yeah, we'll stop there. Yeah, it's fine. So, so, so let, me, let me push back just a little bit as well in response to Vivian's question. Because in the US military, we found 
incorporation of African Americans to be a lot easier than anyone expected in the military as opposed to society. We have seen movement on the LGBT community now and you know we all thought that don't ask don't tell was for for the rest of uh, all time and now we're seeing you know openly serving generals in the military uh, I think there is something about the gender component however that's been slower and I don't really get it so maybe you can reflect on that either of you well, I'll just make a I, 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 my, a thought came to my mind. Actually, in one of the issues that we're trying and struggling to get females to stay in the military, now we have uh, listened to what our Norwegian friend has been doing for years. When you get conscripts or initial soldiers joining the army, usually they were segregated, men's compartment, women's compartment. Now they are joined together. So they sleep in the same room. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. But so far, we've got very positive feedbacks on that. Mm -hmm. So I've been in units where we've been trying to actually nourish and trying to do whatever it takes to keep women in. When I was young, I actually had more than 50 women in my first unit. And I kept them throughout my tenure. But it takes a lot of effort to adapt to a lot of issues. And as you said, there are dinosaurs in the chain of command who don't like women in the military. For sure. There are. And uh, before they understand it, before they get it, and it goes all the way to the top, I'm not sure we're going to get to those 10, 15% in the Army that we're supposed to. Okay. And did you want to pick up again? or No, no I, I think what you're saying is, is very important about, because we, we, we have done that throughout we, have, uh, we used to have conscription and it ended in 2010, but uh, military service was open for women since 1984 and all positions since 1989. And they have always been uh, serving together with the men. Uh, it's, I think it's important for, to be integrated in, 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 a, in the group. Because if you're one woman in a, a rifle company, you don't want to live somewhere else. You want to be with your group, right? right. Yeah. I just want to add one thing to, the, to this conversation. I was working with the Norwegian force commanders in Liberia and President uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf had set a target for recruitment of women into the new armed forces and they weren't meeting the target. And we sat down and there was a tremendous commitment by the Norwegians to try to move this forward. And we said, well, they said, well, people aren't showing up to recruitment. And then we realized that women weren't showing up. Well, actually, they were showing up. They were just being cut in, in front of by men in line. So they never got to the front of the line. So they set up different days for recruiting. And then they set up different tables for recruiting. And so they got a few more women. But then women who had been disadvantaged in education didn't meet the high school diploma requirements. So the women were being cut out there. So then they set up a a graduate equivalency diploma program for the women and they tried to educate them and they found that that got a few more women in but they that was a look down on the GED was looked down on relative to a degree so not that many women were coming and then they finally started to see a few more women coming and they realized they had no policies for women no maternity leave no illness policies no uh, uniforms for women no restrooms for women no uh, housing for women and you, know, you peel back the onion and you realize that it's a lot more difficult and there are many more issues embedded so I say that just to say there can be all kinds of things that you don't think of initially that impede progress towards uh -huh. this agenda. The other could one I was going to answer was a yeah, civil society on, question. Um, so I really appreciate the question and I, and I think it's incredibly important. I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. I think it really depends on what it is you're trying to bring women into, the approach will vary. In cases like formal negotiations, you simply need to have a mediator or a convener who is, um, if not ordering, then really insisting and continuing to ask the question and the right kinds of questions and, and encouraging that to take place. Because you can have agitation and, and advocacy by 500 women on the grassroots, but if nobody's listening or responding, you're not going to get that responsiveness. For us, you can convene groups on, on the ground and you have to make sure once again that you're 
putting your converse, your advertising in the right ways, you're holding meetings at times when women are available, you're holding sessions in places that women feel comfortable going to, and then you'll start to get those women's groups. If you're talking about how you contract with women, there's a real need to build the capacity of women's organizations to do the accounting and the proposal writing, because what we find is often the women's organizations are very powerful, but they lack some of that back office capacity because they're either less funded or they're smaller and more nascent organizations. So depending on your approach, the needs will vary. Um, and I think the more that you think about where there are those gaps, um, whether it's networks, then mandate that 50% of anybody invited to uh, a party and important gatherings and conferences are women. And you start to construct those networks, and then they start to be invited regularly. And by tailoring your tactics, you get a lot more progress. And Carla truly knows of what she speaks. She was the executive director for Women Waging Peace and Inclusive Security, which has set up a global network of women's peace builders, a courageous group of people. Ambassador, you get, I think, the last comment if you want it. Just one quick comment regarding civil society and how to involve women's organizations in, in peace processes. I agree that someone sort of needs to pick up on the interest and the activism on the ground. Someone needs to come in and finance national gatherings. Someone needs to come in and, and fly people to the, where the parties are, etc., etc. So someone needs to do that. That's absolutely true. Uh, true. I, I tend to find uh, many times that, uh, at least in my experience, that we, we, we focus a lot on, on the procedural issues yes, when we talk right. about gender issues. And we mm. often we forgot that there is a substantive part to this as well. And for example, in the Colombian peace process, we talk about uh, women's participation in different mechanisms at the table, recounting heads, etc., etc. And we tend to forget that this is about a substantive issue. And we tend to forget that the point of all this is to not to count heads or include women in some mechanism, in some process. The point is to make a better end result, have a better process in, in, uh, to get a better end result and to transform society, make a better, better society and a more equal society, and that's really the substantive part of this. So we need to, I think we need to continue counting heads, but sometimes the counting of heads sort of takes the headlines, and I think yeah, that's probably uh, counterproductive Excellent. once in a while. Uh, I apologize to the last uh, questioner. Uh, we're going to have to end here. I did want to ask if anybody had one last sentence that they need to say, please. One of the uh, questions I usually get when we do these kind of sessions is, um, what's the use? How do we get off the ground? And um, how we get off the ground is better, being better prepared than we have been. When we deploy to missions, we don't focus on anything else but the military mission. There's a whole variety of organizations, international organizations, non-government organizations, UN, World Bank, you name it. If we do not set up a sort of a code of uh, conduct and try to coordinate what we're going to do when we get into a mission, we waste a lot of ammunition. We waste a lot of good, good efforts because everybody's trying to do what is good for everybody. Instead of competing, why don't we share? I mean, if we had shared in Iraq, if we had shared in Afghanistan, we would have got a lot, lot longer than we have so far. So what I'm trying to tell my superiors all the way up into the NATO chain is get started, set up these organizations so you can coordinate it on beforehand. So next time we have to do a mission somewhere, we know exactly what we want to do to combat corruption and how we're going to integrate women into the peace process, and how we're going to build a society and institutions simultaneously mm -hmm. as we fight the war, so we don't have to find out and figure out what to do once the enemy is beaten. Great. This is the lesson learned from all the missions Thank I've you. been to, and still we haven't lifted it off the ground yet. There's a lot of fighting going on between organizations in the field, but if we can just sit down and talk together, as we would like the two components in a war to do, 
we will get a lot further in the future. Thank you. Elizabeth, you've got the last word. That's nice. I, uh, <laughs> I, want to, I want to remind you all that when we talk about women's participation, it is not a limitation to gender issues, women's issues. It is a capacity women have, as well as men, uh, in economy, in uh, security, in whatever, building roads, so that don't just push us only to, to think about the gender women issues when we participate. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, invite Kathleen here uh, and just a, a, a couple of sentences if I could. Uh, picking up on, on Elizabeth's point, Kathleen has really been in the forefront of involving men in this agenda as well. And it is important to bring along the partners, the advocates, uh, and to, to welcome the supporters. I often feel I'm part of the men's auxiliary of women waging peace. Uh, I also uh, am abusing her time, and I've got to be careful because she was my editor uh, for uh, a chapter in Women and War. And if you read uh, Elizabeth's book, you also have to read this book because it's a great compendium about uh, power and protection in the 21st century for women. Please. Thank you so much, Dawn, and this distinguished panel. And I'm going to ask all of you to hold your applause for a minute, because there are a few others that I want to thank here. As you well know, that something like this kind of event can't go on without special people at the embassies. And so I just want to say thank you, Rina, Anki, Ellinger, Sigbjorn, and Helena for even my abuse of how I pronounce your names. But it has been a great joy to work with you and for your teams and volunteers. To our USIP staff who connected all the moving parts and to our own Danielle Robertson who has kept all the moving parts working together, which is no small feat with five embassies. And uh, Thank you all. I want to take a special moment to thank the Swedish and Finnish Embassy, who will now welcome you to a reception to follow. This is a wonderful opportunity to get to know one another. Please walk out of here with at least two or three more contacts. And finally, I want to recognize two of our USIP grantees who are joining us today from Iraq, who are working on an emergency national action plan on women, peace, and security. Please welcome them during the reception, Suzanne Areff and Lisa Hido. Again, thank you all for joining us today and celebrating uh, this event. Oh, and I see my colleague up here, Ambassador Steve Steiner, part of the Men, Peace and Security. And I want to thank our own Bill Taylor for his dedication to this effort. Please join me in thanking all of these people and especially our panel. party departs. The reception you'll find is up that direction. The reception is in the International Women's Commons.